So at this point, we are going to start with um, introductions. My name is Mercy Shabango, and I will be the facilitator for today's session. Um, can the HUB team kindly introduce themselves, starting from Babi Jamini? Good afternoon, Tim. My name is Karen Jamini. I work here for the Palladio Tennis. Thank you, Professor. Afternoon, colleagues. My name is Sandy Matlangu. I'm working at a uh, Swatini Hospice at home. Thank you, Mr. Matlangu. Afternoon, Tim. Uh, my name is Sabino Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Afternoon, colleagues. My name is Pius Kumar. Thank you, Pius. Afternoon, colleagues. My name is Matlangu. I'm a student. Yeah, thank you, Nathanado. After I'm also a student. Thank you, Kosi. Um, can you also introduce yourselves, colleagues? Um, can we start with uh, Tanda Zilef Melane? Please introduce yourself. And please let us know if you are joining with anyone from your side. So, sorry, Tandasile, I think we, we are losing you there. Is it possible that you probably check if your your sound is okay, your audio? Okay, I think we are struggling with the signal this time. Okay, but now you are you are okay. We can hear you. Okay, so it's Tandazile Milani here from Manzini Government Hospital Palliative Care Unit. Um, I'm connecting with Dr. Smetlane. Um, okay. the rest of the team will be connecting from their conference room. I think they'll introduce themselves. Okay, thank you, thank you so much, Tandazile. Can Dr. Hasnatana also greet us? Good afternoon, colleagues. Yeah, my, as you already mentioned, my name is Dr. Matlani, and um, um, I feel like uh, it's quite uh, a privilege to be joining the team, and also I'll be sharing a presentation today. Thank you. Thank you, Tawatela. We are so excited um, to have you for our eco session today. Uh, can we also have Nonzigela Londuli introducing herself? Afternoon, colleagues. My name is Nonzigela from RFM Eswatini, Manzin. Thank you. I'll be joining alone. Thank you, Nonzigela Uh Can we have Maya Zodra introducing herself. <laughs> Can we have Maya Kameta introduce herself as well? Good afternoon, colleagues. Zodra Kameta working for Swatin Hospital at home. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Maggie. Um, I can also see that Mr. Mvila is still trying to connect. Um, I believe that in the interest of time, um, we can continue introducing ourselves in the chat box. Um, there's also Pascal, can you introduce yourself? Pascal, kindly introduce yourself. Okay, we will move on to Malaika. Please introduce yourself, Malaika. Hello, everyone. I am Malaika. I'm from Echo India. 
and I am executive in Echo India and I wish you all, all the best for the session. Thank you. Thank you, Malaika. Um, as I mentioned before, because of time, we are going to continue with our introductions in the chat box for those who are not able to introduce themselves or for those who will join us during the course of the session. Kindly introduce yourselves in the chat box by writing your name, the facility you are from, and anyone else that you could be joining with. Um, just a reminder, colleagues, as we are beginning our session, that um, we should be mindful of our gadgets or our devices. So we are encouraged to put them on silent and to be mindful of background noises in, in moments where you have to unmute and share something so that there's no um, disturbance. Um, if there's any comment or question, or if you're struggling to get us, you can use the raise of hand or use the chat box to notify us during the course of the session. Um, for our last session, we looked at prescribing a short acting opioid, and we got a case presentation from RFM Palliative Care Unit. Um, just to make a follow up on that case, um, we would like to check with Ness Nduli. Uti, are there any updates um, on, on the on last session's case or any feedback that she, she could give us about the, the case she presented on? Is, is it possible that you share feedback, uh, feedback or an update about last session's case? Okay, uh, one of us, uh, one of the team last, uh, last meeting suggested that maybe we need to ask if the, uh, if the patient can be visited at home. Uh, the patient came because he, he, he usually comes for dressing in, in our unit. He agreed. Uh, yesterday, he went for chemotherapy for the second session. That's all I can say. Um, thank you. Thank you, Nancy Galelo. I don't know if there's any questions or comments from, from the team. Maget <coughs> Namini. Thank you very much, Chair. There was a, a, a suggestion on the case presentation that maybe she or her, her team that do a thorough pain assessment because looking at the, the, the pain medication that the patient was receiving and the pain remained you know, not controlled. So we, there were some suggestions that she could maybe uh, we, we could ask if she, she did something with regards to pain management. I am not sure if you got Maria Lamine's question, Nancy Yarello. Concerning the pain medication, what I've noted is that the patient is is so comfortable using the, the, the syrup rather than the tablet. And he, he uses paracetamol for brachial pain. I don't know, maybe. Uh, yeah. So from from that medication is is that is I don't know, but is is it responding to to the pain? He said it, it is still working. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Last time when you presented the case, there was a concern that the, when you score the pain, it may be high. And then, but if today the pain is being controlled, because we added some 
some other avenues which you could maybe address, like psychosocial pain, spiritual pain, because you, you said that the pain remained up, it wasn't controlled by the pain medication that you were giving to the patient, such that there were some recommendations that you maybe use when assessing the pain. That was my follow up, but then if you, you this time the pain is being controlled, I think it is fine, you can go. Uh, uh, thank you, Nkosi, and thank you, Nansigelelo, for that update. Um, so we are going to move now, colleagues, to our presentation for the day. And we are going to be getting the presentation from Dr. Smatlane, um, who will be taking us through monitoring for opioid um, efficacy, side effects, and substance use disorder. So I don't know if, Dawadela, you are already on your side, if you can... Um, start maybe sharing the screen for you. Presentation. Oh. Presentation Now a question. Am I only both? Um, we, we can hear you, but sometimes you're cut. You you can go ahead, Okay. Okay. My name is Mani. I'm working at the Mazin Government Hospital on Um, so I'll be taking you through the uh, monitoring of We we'll basically start with the introduction. Uh, okay, the class of drugs in opium opium plant. They can be uh can be prescription pain medication or drug drugs. Uh, the main medication medically is uh, primarily for pain control, especially for moderate severe pain. But other indications are they are also used as cop suppressants or antiviral drugs. The mechanism of action they act on presynaptic terminal and the postsynaptic neuron. The presynaptic action of opioids is to limit neurotransmitter release, and this is the main effect in the nervous system. Opioids bind to just to trigger is to feeling of pleasure and pain relief. Um, the challenges associated with opioid use, um, the side effects. Um, this uh, medication is quite toxic. We'll look at the side effects when to the medications, and some of them they can really be. And there's also a high risk of overdose. There is also a problem of opioid use disorders. By definition, opioid use disorder is a problematic problem of opioid use leading to or distress. Um, because of these problems, the has are diagnosed to develop by different professional bodies or segments of the space between problems of this medication. Uh, so, as much as they are in the environment, there are some problems with using free sports and the certain limit of the speech in the book. And also, in the education, it is the cautious meaning of speech until you reach the end of the speech or something about the speech that has arrived in the age. Yeah, there is also a list of education strategies, such as using these methods in the tools 
So patients have to be well informed about uh, these medications, the side effects, and also the risks, and also the um, the cause of the medication decision. And also, they should also be doing testing. Um, consideration on prescription of opioids, patients should receive appropriate pain treatment based on careful consideration of benefits and risk. So patients should be well informed and consent to treatment. Um, we don't call to this, uh, making sure that they sign uh, informed consent, but in ideal situation, this should be happening because of uh, the high risk profile of this uh, medication. And also there should be a clear plan on how to stop when this outweighs the benefits. And this should be discussed with the patient before he starts uh, this treatment. Um, we also have to know that we need to avoid morphine or use this caution if we have to use it in order to save the level of hepatic disease. It's also important that we have to stay focused on strong and analgesic medication. It's important to know that at the same level of patients on the morphine, the same person so how do we uh, mitigate this problem before we do our uh, okay situation which has been about to be infected in each case level of cancer patient who is the initial of fluid. The side effects should be anticipated so that it can be properly managed in the patient's so education and also awareness from the health of the patient and also education from the screen by teaching our patients so that we report on time and they have this progress is important. Um most things I think is the most standard policy analysis to do solidarity and also of course it's very cheap and it's not a mass emotions. But it has been situated as a other options. Now, looking at the side effects of uh, the therapeutic opioids, as I said, we have to be able to recognize them and also do that uh, early enough so that we can retire early so that we uh, don't end up taking challenges with the medical patients. Uh, we are divided into uh, six teams. We have the gastrointestinal, lab where we have constipation, uh, xerostomia, Nausea and vomiting, gastroesophageal reflux. Some of these uh, uh, side effects, you know, um, we have to notice that they also overlap with the, the chemo medication that we use to treat cancer. So we have to be able to know which one we need to take, which one is that we need to some of the side effects. The other thing we have to do is that we have to Uh, 
specific sexual dysfunction and osteoporosis. Immune system, we have a T cell, it's a T cell, it's also a monocyte dysfunction. We also have certain uh, kind of dysregulation. Most of our patients that are being compromised are still in this situation. One of the most major situations was to find out they have dysfunctional immune system in our world. Now, we have a normalized test that we need to do to monitor patients on autos. Uh, this test will not only do them after we started autos, we need to do them before we start also so that we know how our patients were before we started them. So that uh, if in, in cases where they are functionally mutated, we have to be checked about them. So we have already spoken about the uh, hepatic and uh, renal failure. So we need to so we have to do the brain chart screen. We may do a renal test. We have to do liver enzymes. So that the urine, we can also check the patient we already have a very existing renal failure. We also have to know the HIV status of our patients before we start them on board us. Uh, and also the hepatitis uh, status, we need to know which one is this one, the hepatitis B and the hepatitis C. For management of side effects, we will basically we won't go into each one of them uh, because that will you know, we take time if we go into each one of them and see how to manage. However, before we start this whole project, we have to anticipate the side effects. So the knowledge of these side effects is important so that we also uh, need to uh, for the quality medication before the size of the side effects of okay. The common part is that when we prescribe one we have to also be assertive uh, because we know that it's what it will be most of the patients are going to have this patient. So the other problem with vomiting is quite common, so it's important to consider the medication for our patients. We don't have to wait until this problem is there. So uh, the best management is going to anticipate the problem before it occurs and try to anticipate how to solve it instead of waiting for it to occur. So for some of the interventions that we use, we need to include a dose reduction. We can also uh, do symptomatic management for the side effects, which is the one that I say we should always uh, anticipate it. And some of the common ones we should give the medication for the treatment of the case. We can also do operative application, as we already talked about, uh, that some patients can get into other side effects or we find that the medication is not anticipated enough. So if we change to a different one, if I let the army be very better. Uh, this is basically because of the some of the subtypes of the centers uh, of what you raise. Um, another intervention would be changing the way of administration. It has been noticed that maybe if you have, for example, if you have to do an IV and you change it to color, some of the scientists may get better. Also, those who are having a museum for me to change to IV for color, maybe it will have to be better. Next one. Now, looking at uh, who could use this order. And disorders and treatment. Uh, this basically is a chronic relapsing illness associated with significant increased rates of morbidity and mortality. Um, there is a DSM 5 uh, for diagnostic uh, categories and criteria for opioid use disorder. Um, this information is usually available on the data, so for those who are interested in they can access it. And, uh, this basically passes us to make uh, the proper psychiatric diagnosis for this kind of patients. Uh, this case is a result of misuse of prescribed opioid medication, or the use of opioid medication, or the use of illicit opioid medication. In terms of treatment of these disorders, uh, we can use opioid agony, we can use uh, 
you can also use uh, language based, new classes based treatment that is with uh, psychosocial and intervention. And move to the next one. Thank you. Um, now uh, we just uh, wrap up the presentation by looking at the medicines that we can use uh, to treat uh, opioid use disorders. Um, yes, I have already given this summary in the previous slide. Uh, we have a uh, morphine, which is a partial opioid in our set of employees, suppresses and reduces training for opioids. We have a uh, methadone. Methadone, which is a full opioid receptor agonist. Um, this one reduces opioid craving and withdrawal and also ties of loss and stress of opioids. We have a uh, nitroxone, which is opioid receptor antagonist. This one loss the withdrawal or sedative effect of opioids. It should be uh, we should know that it should be started after a minimum of seven to ten days to be able to to avoid precipitation of severe opioid withdrawal. So we need to be careful about this one in certain ways are available. We have uh, the Luxor, which is a competitive uh, opioid antagonist and uh, synthetic progen of oxymorphine. This one we, uh, is very large in the clinical setting, so it's not as hard as that. We should always have available to treat our patients, especially in our setting where we use a lot of things. Thank you very much. This is some of the references uh, I've used. It's not all of them. Thank you, Dr. Smetanya, for the presentation. Um, it was a very important presentation where we were able to learn the importance of monitoring and, and managing side effects. Um, one of the things that I picked is that changing the route of administration is also key in the management of um, the side effects. So at this point, colleagues, this is an opportunity for us to ask any questions or make any comments based on the presentation. Um, that we've just received from Dr. Smetane. We can use the chat box to ask or make a comment or make um, other contributions, or we could use the raise of hand. Do you have any questions or comments? That was the head from Mr. Mashang on my side. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, my, 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 my question would be, Looking at the, the the situation we have in the country uh, and the the drug test that we normal that we have said must be done sometimes to help in the prescription of uh, these medications, uh, how best can we help those patients that you find that now they cannot come to the facility maybe to do those blood tests or how frequently should blood tests be done? on a patient on opioids, especially in our context, we are giving patients who are on morphine. Hello, I you, you got cut somewhere. We are continuing. It's not oh, stable, okay. yes. It's, I, I was saying to go tell her, uh, looking at asking about it. 
the the frequency of maybe the blood test for those clients you find that in the country some clients are in the hard to reach areas you know and maybe they were initiated on opioids and sometimes they may not physically come to the facility due to different constraints so i was asking uh, how frequently should a person on opioid more especially in our context morphine should come for blood test and also the risk factors because um in our the type of patients we have is not only our opioids that can cause those uh complications but there are also other risk factors because of the disease they have. so it depends on the risk profile of the patient if they are in the settings where they come on a monthly basis for those ones there is reason for them to be checked the, the bloods on a monthly basis. But uh, if there are low risk uh, in rural communities, maybe we can decide to maybe check them once in two months or so. I think that's how we can do it. Thank you, Doug. Uh, thank you, Mr. Matang, for the question, and thank you, Dr. Dela, for the response. It seems Mr. Matang was satisfied. Um, do we have any other questions or comments for Dr. Dela um, on the presentation? Okay, colleagues, it seems we do not have any other questions or comments, but in case we are leaving you behind, you feel free to use the chat box to ask the question. It will be um, attended to. Okay, I can see a hand from Pascal. You can unmute yourself and ask. Uh, afternoon, colleagues. Uh, uh, this is Dr. Sipesi. Thank you so much, Dr. Simashani, for the presentation. Mine is actually just uh, a comment or an addition. Um, before we actually diagnose and diagnose patients as uh, being um, uh, or having opioid use disorders, they actually need to be thoroughly assessed by a clinical psychologist or a psychiatrist. Uh, but and then most of the time, when do we suspect? Uh, opioid use disorder. It's actually usually young adults, uh, patients with previous underlying mental health disorders like your depression, your bipolars. Uh, and then it's a patient with a history of alcohol or substance abuse. So if you actually have any patient who falls under that category and you suspect, they actually need to be referred for a thorough assessment with a psychiatrist or a clinical psycho psychologist because we don't want to end up like diagnosing patients and then not giving them the proper care because we are suspecting. So the diagnosis should actually be made and we're definite that the patient is actually addicted. I mean, the patient has a, subs has a use disorder before we actually start any interventions because we've seen a lot of our patients who are actually poorly managed uh, as far as uh, pain management is concerned. Now they end up hopping around from hospital to hospital trying to get hold of the opioid. And then they are actually now called addicted to the opioid, whereas maybe it's actually outside care workers who are poorly managing their pain. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spe. Um, Can you respond, Dr. Smetane? Uh, presented. So, thank you for the comment, Dr. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Teda. Um, if there are any other questions, or, if there are any other questions or comments, can we also use the chat box um, so that we can move to our case presentation for the day? Um, so for our case presentation, we will be getting it from Manzini Government Hospital, um, palliative care nurse Tandazile Stimelane. I believe you are ready to share um, 
your case with us, Tanda Zile. We'll also be sharing the screen from our side. Um, good afternoon, colleagues. Afternoon. Um, may I check if I'm audible enough from your side? Yes, we can hear you clearly. Oh, okay. No, pardon us. We sometimes have challenges with our signal from time to time. Uh, if you're having challenges, then just um, let us know. All right. Okay. I'm struggling technology here. <laughs> okay. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, it's Manzini Government Hospital. So yes, uh, we have we have um please just note colleagues, we will be presenting a case uh of, of someone who unfortunately passed on. Uh but then we felt that um uh firstly uh, we felt it's it's it could be a more appropriate um, case to discuss in line with the, with the presentation that was just done by Dr. Sumatlane, but also for academic purposes, because we feel like we need to learn, uh, then there's a lot that we can learn through uh, experience sharing. So yes, we had a 40, 42 year old female uh, with cervical cancer, uh, with distant metastasis to the lungs and, and bones. Can you move a bit down? So this this client that we had, uh, it she came in as a transfer in from um, another facility, and uh, the history that we got is that she had actually she had actually gotten her chemotherapy and radiation, and had actually completed all that. So when she came in, uh, came in as as a transfer in, uh, there isn't much uh, records for her this side except for um, uh, what was shared in the referral note. Referral so the problem uh, uh, they had on admission, um, they were reporting constant pain and insomnia. So the client was actually requesting for sedatives and uh, she actually uh, was asking specifically for morphine IM. So then our concern was that the the client was actually already on uh, 30 milligrams of the morphine IM, which she was taking BIG. And according to her, it was a medication that she got from a private doctor. So the client would sometimes take the same medication, the same 30 milligrams uh, for breakthrough pain. Uh, also of note is that the client was self emitting um, so our concern was that could it be a case of drug dependency or tolerance, or she was actually asking for the um, for the morphine basically for its euphoric effect and its sedative effect. So those are some of the concerns that we had, uh, and uh, it, it wouldn't have been easy to just come up with an uh, with a probably diagnosis like Dr. Spessel has just alluded to it, that you not just come up with a diagnosis to say, because you are suspecting addiction, then there is addiction. It may look like a bird, but it doesn't seem like a bird. So the chief complaint on admission, the client was pale and she was confused and probably due to the hypercalcemia, which was taken care of, uh, which was taken care of. And a few days later, the client's, uh, the confusion cleared. So on assessment, unfortunately, there is this, I don't know who can ask me, there is this um, pop-up screen that is distracting me here. So I cannot see quite clearly everything. Let me, okay. Oh, good, got that. All right, I think we're good now. So on assessment, we did a physical assessment. The client was bed confined. Uh, she complained of discomfort and she, hence she would uh, toss and turn. She complained of generalized body pain and this pain, according to her, it was severe, severe pain. And she had persistent cough. She had multiple scars on examination. She had multiple IM scars on both thighs, uh, as we had actually reported earlier that the client was self-injecting. 
socioeconomic status. Uh, the client is a PAO. She's divorced with three kids. And in court, uh, uh, according to how she described uh, the situation with the kids, she would say the first one is just a weirdo and she wouldn't say much about her. Then the second one, apparently they had a, a relationship with the second one and was undergoing psychotherapy uh, amongst other things because of the reason that she was the one who was taking care of the mother. So she wasn't, she wasn't um, doing quite well. So I was undergoing psychotherapy with a private or, or a different um, facility, not in our facility. Then the third one, she was comfortable with. She, he's fine. He's with the dead in South Africa. And the client has a stable source of income. Emotionally, uh, when we assessed uh, in our, in our, in our, in our assessment, uh the client was aware that she is actually at end of life she was aware that she was actually that, that the the cancer has actually spread to the lungs and the bones um however each time you would get to her uh when you try to engage she would be a bit um agitated and reporting that she needs something for the pain like she would constantly ask for something for the pain and uh, she did mention that she was worried about the mom to the extent that she wasn't even comfortable having the mom around because she felt like it's too much for her mom to take uh, and see her in that condition. Uh, and she would mention a will. Uh, she would mention that she 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 needed uh, to work on her will, but unfortunately, she wouldn't elaborate on where the will had actually been drawn, and she wants to make adjustments or. It, it, it was just drawing the wheel from scratch. Uh, unfortunately, when we tried to uh, prop that one, she wouldn't get into details about it. Then she was also worried about her kids, particularly number two, the one we said she um, felt like she had a relationship, according to her, because number one for her, she would just say, ah, that one is a weird dog. Then the dead one, she felt like, ah, that one is in good hands because it's with the father in South Africa. Then spiritually, okay, spiritually, um, the client, according to what she said, she said she's not she's not someone who's so much inclined to religion. Yes, she knows that. Um, please note, she said she's not so much inclined to religion, but yes, she knows that there is a God. At least that's how they have been brought up from from home. Then mental status examination. A uh, client would pay less attention to the sessions that we used to have. We we used to try to keep them very short, but she wouldn't pay much attention. Um, she would co constantly ask for the morphine, specifically the IM one, and um, the mood on was mostly on the downside, and most yeah, it was mostly mostly on the downside. But there was coercion in her speech, and uh, she had sorry about that. She had full insight of her prognosis and rules of care. Her lifestyle client was, was reported to be a chain smoker. Um, to, to the extent that until, because I think we had her, like, we admitted her for something like 10 days, but until the recent admission, um, she was still doing a bit of cigarettes. So at some point, uh, alcohol, but then with the alcohol, it wasn't much of an issue for her. The issue was the smoking. Then, um, yes, she would party quite often. Are we still together? Hello? Y yes, yes, yes. We yes. are following. Oh, okay. I hope I'm not I'm not confusing. I'm not confusing you. Otherwise, okay, on pain assessment, we, we use the PQRST uh, tool. So, okay, we use the PQRST um, tool. The duration of the pain was reported to be plus or minus two months because she said she had uh, just completed the radiation in less than three months. But since she got back, she hasn't been feeling very well, but the pain has been has been there for plus or minus two months. 
So she's been managing the pain from home until she started feeling uh, okay. She started um, having those those episodes of confusion. Then they brought her into hospital. A characteristic of the pain, she was reporting deep penetrating pain. And probably due to the fact that uh, the cancer is actually spread even to, to, to the bones. So she would say she's having generalized pain, which is just deep penetrating. As, as, as a result, she would find it hard to sleep on one position. So the numerical rating was between four and five, depending on when you found her, because after taking the medication, she would kind, kind of calm down and manage to sleep. But she would say that, that the pain is just between four and five. It's just extreme pain. Um, and it was constant pain, according to her. If she doesn't take um, the opioid, then she would have constant pain. Okay, Precip precipitating factors. Amongst other things, she would... Uh, mentioned that with the slightest movements or the slightest motion that she makes, then she would feel the pain. But sometimes she would even report the pain just with lying down. So she would be like, I need something for the pain. I cannot find out. Uh, relieving factors, uh, according to her, there was just nothing other than the pain medication. There was uh, probably no way for her to distract um which is why if you remember very well um in our introduction we said our one of our concerns was that is it a dependency or it was that the client wanted the morphine for its sedative effect so she would say that there's just nothing that relieves the pain except for the medication um yes it did it it did affect her, her sleeping pattern actually the client would uh, report insomnia even if she were to fall asleep, then she would find it hard to remain asleep like the night through. Uh, it did affect uh, immobility. The uh, patient was already bed confined and uh, she would toss and turn because of the pain she was actually experiencing. Yes, the IM morphine was relieving the client um, according to what she reported. She was specific that, okay, the IM morphine actually helps her feel better. Okay, uh, the pain evaluation, but most of that has, has been uh, the duration is plus or minus two months generalized pain. The scale is between four and five, which was severe pain. Um, uh, the possible cause was probably due to this progression. Also, we, we couldn't rule out emotional pain because the client was, seemed to have a load. And um, even though we had difficulties uh, actually um, making a breakthrough, but each time you spoke to her, she would kind of, uh, ah, I think it helps. And also involving the family for her, she felt like it actually helps, particularly the mother. She felt like ah, it actually helps. So it could have been due to disease progression, it could have been emotional pain as well. Then uh, treatment, it was a strong opioid, which was morphine in our case. Um, then she was also put on an adjuvant, I mean, triplin, uh, which is also, uh, which, which we actually, had been in the hope that it would actually help sedate her as well. But with the amitriptyline, I think the downside of it was, was that we actually gave it as an adjuvant instead of capitalizing on the fact that we could have also used it as an antidepressant because we picked that she already had emotional pain. But also non-pharmacological means were, were made to actually kind of try to alleviate the pain that she was going through. <clears throat> The progress that we noted, noted following the interventions. Okay, with the interventions, let me let me make it clear that okay, there was a point whereby we felt like like I like I said we we did 
with screening, we checked, okay, the client has history of alcohol, the client has history of smoking, the client has got multiple scars on, on her thighs, both her thighs, she was self-injecting. So there was a point whereby we felt that there is a chance that the client is actually addicted to the opioid. But then we had to actually kind of do a thorough assessment and we got to a point whereby we felt like ah the client is not necessarily addicted to the to the morphine it was just for um, for her amongst other things it was the issue of uh the sedative part of it and also after after trying to attend to those emotional uh, emotional stressors for her the client started saying that she feels better and as a result she started taking them the syrup form the morphine syrup form yet initially she didn't want to so she was comfortable taking the syrup form because with the with the initial with the im1 we were struggling since the client was taking 30 milligrams bid but still we couldn't she still she still was reporting pain so then we had to take her back to liquid morphine and explain to her why we have to take her back to liquid morphine to get uh, the kind the the right uh now uh dosage that would actually work for her so we did that and she continued with, continued with the amitriptyline so with the morphine and the amitriptyline the client was doing fine she didn't ask for more morphine i am she even said that if you feel like i'm addicted addicted to this one you can take it then continue with your with your own management so yes the client afterwards managed to sleep um However, uh, uh, the bad thing is that the general condition of the client persistently took a downward trajectory. She wasn't improving. She got worse. Like she spent less than ten days in the hospital, in the hospital, and uh, she deceased after after ten days. So, with regards to with regards to the pain management, yes, the progress we saw was that. We were we were winning with uh, controlling the pain, uh, and we were using the in syrup form uh, together with an adjuvant. Uh, however, with the general condition, we didn't win for that one. Um, significant medical and surgical history. Like I said, uh, we do not have much of uh, the information. Uh, what we had from our side was that she has a cervical cancer with advanced um, it was advanced cervical cancer with distant, distant metastasis. She had actually completed her chemo radiation in South Africa, and oh yeah, it was a recurrent distant uh, recurrent cancer with distant metastasis. Okay. She was RVD and on art. Medical history, we didn't have much except for what we what was shared that the client had done the chemo radiation in South Africa and uh, completed around October 2022. Then she was only admitted into the facility for, for the parlor and the, the confusion. Relevant past medications, um, yes, she was she had been on morphine and uh, diclofenac, but the diclofenac was stopped. Current medication was the morphine, which we actually switched to morphine, to the morphine syrup. She was on amitriptyline, she was on tran tranexamic acid, she was on prednisolone, city eggs, amoxiclav, uh, ceftriaxone. The antibiotics were added because she had a uh, high white blood cell count. Uh, work status, she was working as a para PA, PA legal. Education, yes, she went up to tertiary. She is a um, social economic class. Oh, sorry about that. She's, she's in the middle class. Marital status, according to her, she's, she's single. She, she doesn't use the divorcee. So she says she's single. Lifestyle habits, it, it was the smoking and alcohol that we, we felt like could actually have a direct bearing on, on the client's condition. Uh, relevant health conditions in the family, uh, she reported that she, she doesn't know anyone who had a cervical cancer. I mean, cancers is within her, her family, be it parental or mother's side. 
our advanced advanced directives they were not done dnr it wasn't done an advanced decision to refuse treatment it wasn't done health care proxy um it wasn't done mental capacity assessment it was done living will no it wasn't done Okay, review of systems, the blood pressure was uh, stable. Um, Dogotela mentioned amongst the side effects that uh, it, it could be a number of side effects. They could be cardiac, they could be neurological, a number of them. So we had to monitor the, the vital signs. We had to monitor all systems. So the blood pressure was stable, pulse was around 98. Um, respirations would range between um, 18 and 24 and uh, this 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 vital signs were taken uh, from um, uh, from uh, records that were towards her uh, last days and the spo2 was um 81% the one that was recorded the pain score was four it was ranged between 4 and 5 the echo score was Okay, she, she moved from ECO3 to ECO4. Then symptoms uh, that we noted, yes, uh, there was pain, dyspnea, it was there. Um, as a result, client was put on, on auto therapy and also considering the um, SPO2, she was put on auto therapy. And uh, actually she, we were preparing client for, for discharge, but unfortunately she, she just deteriorated um, as, as, as they went days went by. Yes, there was anxiety, agitation, depression, um, drowsiness was there. Um, there was no nausea and vomiting. Anorexia was there. She would um, rarely eat. Constipation, she, she, they didn't report any constipation. Dry mouth, yes, dry mouth was there, probably as, as one of the side effects of, um, of the opioid. Poor mobility, yes, she had moderate uh, to severe issues of mobility. Okay, for focused investigations, again, uh, these will only reflect the ones that we did this side. I did mention at some point she had the hyphen like a raised uh, white blood cell count. <laughs> Sometimes I struggle with words. So she, she was put on antibiotics for that. Then uh, the it was around uh, 10 point three, so she wasn't transfused. She was only put on uh, mass supplements diet and uh, constant monitoring. Imaging, we do not have results in the file. So the, uh, the further plan, it, it was actually to continue with supportive care and counseling for the client and the family. Um, also to encourage the clients to attend to priority issues, including the issue of the will. But unfortunately, um, we, we couldn't get to that. Then the client and the family had, had to be engaged on goals of care and issues of home-based care. So we were also trying to prepare the family to actually for, for the client's discharge. Then pain management, we had to continue with the uh, pain management until we successfully control the pain and to link the client to care to home-based care. Unfortunately, the client then um, passed on. Otherwise, I think that would be it from us. But I think the um, the take-home message from our side was that we had we had everything to believe probably that the client um, may have the opioid use disorder. However, we had to carefully screen so that we do not deprive the client the benefit of the morphine under the pretext that we think she is addicted to, to, to the opioid. Otherwise, thank you so much. Thank you, Tandazile, for the lovely presentation. I believe it was clear for all of us. We were able to follow. So if at this point, um, I would open the opportunity for us to ask any questions or make any comments or contributions. We understand the client is late, but as Tandazile mentioned before, there is probably a lot that we can learn from this case.
So you can um, use the raise of hand or use the chat box to, to ask a question or make a comment. Thank you very much, Tanzania, for such a presentation. Uh, as you said, I will appreciate the fact that you, you, you did say that the patient was always in need of the morphine, who should also interfere with her level of consciousness, such that we couldn't even take enough heat away from her. Even when we tried to, to engage her, if we take it, she would always ask for the medication. And she, would, I think by so doing, she was avoiding many of those patients that would, would have made help her in getting more information. Like in the, in the fact that she, she said she had three children, the first one she would only describe him or her as widow. There are so many questions that come that come in when at once someone talk about his or her child is someone who's widow. Uh, and that that is that word would also maybe bring to me as a nurse. I would think there is something else that would also affect her level of pain, psychosocial. And the second one, she did say that she's undergoing psychotherapy because of the hair condition, hair condition. The third one is okay. There are so many issues with the hair. And like I said, we appreciate the fact that she was always a difficult patient to get history from, especially with the, as I've talked about, psychosocial, the spiritual part. She said she knows that she bears God. And then what's the relationship? That the fact that she knows that the God, what does it that what that part have an effect in, in her condition? What does she think? By her, by God being there to her, what does that mean? And the condition that she was in, what the, what does it mean to her? Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm just, yeah, you had a, a very typical case for you to manage. Like you said, it is just for the purposes. Had we had enough time, maybe we'll get more information from the mother, whom she would also all try to avoid. When we are talking to her, she would be afraid that. She would information that would hurt the mother, like maybe some information would hurt the, the, the second child to the effect that she even went through psychotherapy. Yeah, that's all I can say. Thank you, by the way. Thank you, Kosi. I believe, and um, Chanazile, you were able to get what Mari Namini was saying. Tandazile, are you still with us? I was trying to follow, but yeah, we are still with you, but yeah, the signal this side is real bad. We were trying to follow. Um, I think she mentioned something regarding the spirituality. Uh, I think for her, what she would say, she would actually um, express it that ah, she she she's not someone who is so much inclined to religion, but she didn't mention anything about any other forms of um, uh, belief that she may have. And um, with uh, they, there was there was a spony that she was with. She mentioned that there was a point where they tried to get um, a pastor for her, but then their session didn't end well. So the pastor left. But uh, towards the, the last days, then it, uh, another team came. 
but I think basically that was basically for the for the family, not necessarily for the client. I think she she didn't have much um understanding or she felt like uh, it doesn't have much bearing in, in in her in her life. Thank you. Thank you, Tanda Zile, for that clarity. I believe Maria Tamini is answered. I don't know if there's anything that she wants to add. Uh, uh, maybe I may add that what happened to the mother was the mother of help to you with regards to getting some information, especially concerning the first child, whom the parent could not even describe this the situation and have a relationship with the child. Did you maybe get something, some information from, from her mother? Um, unfortunately, oh, sorry. unfortunately, we didn't get anything from her mother. The only information we got from her was from the was from the sister-in-law. She did mention that uh, that one she's she's like all over the place, but she didn't tell us much about the relationship the mom had with the kid. Otherwise, from the mother's side, from the grandmother's side, we didn't explore much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Tandazile. Um, are there any other questions or um, any other comments that we would make towards the case that has been presented, Mr. Yeah. Mashamu? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Tandazile and team. You know, uh, this is a very painful case. Um, indeed, thank you so much to bring it up. In my experience in providing palliative care, these things do happen. Um, and uh, it's unfortunate here you have limited time to, to address the issues because 10 days of life is a very short time with such a lot of issues. So it's a very critical, it's unfortunate that the patient came with severe pain and uh, used to the short acting injectables. That one usually happens especially when the patient has been for a long time uh, not properly managed using the opiates, because you can tell now that this patient has been given these short acting opiates and uh, they were not working for her. So then she will be always looking for something that will immediately attend to that issue, but then goes down as quickly as possible. The try then you will see that he has been pricking herself with the injectables for a long time. And I'm wondering, and I'm hoping, and I, how much I pray uh, those uh, practitioners were there when today Dr. Smetlana was presenting about the monitoring and management of uh, uh, opioids efficacy. Uh, they were there when uh, Mr. William Villa was presenting on how to prescribe an opioid. They were there when we were discussing the issue of a short acting opioid because this is one of the problems we may face with this patient. But then the reality normally is that when these patients are approaching the end, normally the pain becomes more severe. So you will find that they are looking for something that can suit in this physical pain they are going through. So it's very difficult to tell whether it was tolerance or what, or what was it was uh, poor management on our side, the healthcare workers, because how dare we can. Uh, prescribe injectable opioids for such a long time. Even physician post op uh, uh, post surgery, they would not say inject inject. You find out they will say maybe I agree for a certain period, but then you know we were you you were given such a patient. So it's unfortunate that even we don't know what happened on diagnosis. I forget that the patient was saying. He's now used to, he's aware of uh, the goals of care and the prognosis, but looking at how the patient is protecting other relatives uh, from what is happening really to her, it's a sign that the patient has a lot to be helped to go through. But unfortunately, this time around, we couldn't. I think as healthcare professionals, let's escalate the issue of palliative care to others. You know, Most of our patients are in danger of these opioids, you know, because now the, 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 the children are left with another picture 
of a woman full of wounds of injectables of opioids, you know. Tomorrow we don't know how they will handle this situation. But for you, it was very difficult to deal with it at a small at a short time. However, then let me just add some uh, experience on the issue of uh, spirituality assessment, you know. Sometimes I may be tempted because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a religious person or I'm a Christian to ask a question that will channel the patient towards a God. But then I will, I will propose that we can go around, look at the, the, the hope model. In palliative care, the hope model for pain assessment and management, it's easier to, to give you open-ended questions. Once a patient you ask him related to God, he will quickly tell you God whatever, yet spirituality sometimes is not God related. It's connected to what is supernatural to you. Some people, um, they found hope on other people. Some they find hope on an environment. Some they find hope on uh, their loved ones. Some they find hope in, in certain activities. So it is proper then to open that question of like, where do you get hope? when things are bad, you see? Where do you throw your strength when things are bad? Because that's the very thing that matters to that patient. Then you can go to the religious groups that patient can be part of or an organization. And in that area, normally we are asking in relation to how much supportive are they to the patient? And then you go towards the, the practices. So in palliative care, it's, if it's an initial map, I'll look for practices, or if I'm scanning to see, will I not breach any practices? But then if I'm looking for a problem or spiritual distresses, you substitute the P with any problems. Do you have any problems regarding to any practices that you have or regarding your spiritual issues? Then they will shoot a lot of problems. You will discover that most of the issues, they are spiritually related. Then you will discover that, that you need to find ways to how to can then help them in terms of the effects of those problems in how this patient life is. So I will say that run away to associate, do you, do you believe in God or whatever? No, because that one, you will find the, uh, uh, one traditional healer, you state God, you, you are in trouble. You find a Hindu man, you state a God, then you are in trouble. So the best way is to ask, where do you get the source of God? I will say that one. For the, the opioids, we are praying that all physicians will teach the other physicians that maybe if we come together as a team like we are doing today, protect our people, alleviate the pain, especially at end of life. The pain is too much. But then if there was a good multidisciplinary team, you will not be uh, given a patient at this stage whereby you don't know. But thank you so much that you managed to move away with the injectables and we hope her, her soul rest in peace mm -hmm. uh, and God protect the children who are already now in grief on top of another grief. And I hope you can trace those families. I believe they need some sort of counseling to go through, especially these children. The other one was already going under counseling because, you know, cancer is another issue. It may erupt in the house and then it be PTSD for them. So that would be my, 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 my contribution. Uh, thank you, Mr. Masamu, for your contribution. Um, before we come to the end of the session, I have just one last question for Tandazile out of interest or curiosity. Um, in a situation like this client's where the client maybe um, wants to sort out issues in their will and possibly they are bedridden and they're still going to be with you for quite a number of days, how are you able to assist um, the client? if they request maybe to sort out issues or meet a lawyer, but they are not able to actually go out and do that by themselves. Um, hey, um, we, we haven't had a, a case like that. I think this is probably the first and um, we are still not sure how best we would have handled it. Um, I think that's one of the things that we may want to benefit from your experiences. Um, thank you, Tandazi. I don't know if anyone from the HUB team would like to um, respond to that. Maria Hamin. Thank you very much. There are some organizations that have 
lawyers in their payroll. Maybe I would suggest that Mandino Hospital will try to find ways to make sure that they have lawyers because we will always, when we are practicing in palliative care, we'll always find issues of patients that would need to be guided and directed towards making the wheels with direct, not directives towards their care, especially when they cannot talk on themselves. So I would suggest maybe HR try to make means that there is someone with legal information attached to the hospital. Um, thank you, Nkosi, for that, for that contribution. I hope that we are not leaving anyone behind, colleagues. Um, I, I can see yes. a raise of hand. Yes, Tanazile. Yes, my daughter Nazile is Dr. Smatang. Yes. Um, I had uh, something in uh, about the provision of palliative care. And then, you know, do you provide the services during the treatment? How far do you go? When you say you start, when the um, is it possible that you repeat yourself again, Dr. Botella? It seems we, we cannot get you well. I don't know if maybe if you can be closer to that device. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. I, I want to check about palliative care. As we say that the practices, we have to uh, start it when the patient is diagnosed with chronic disease. And do we end when the patient dies? Um, we support you with, with during the period of bereavement. I think it was an interesting topic that we were discussing this morning, but there was no clear indication of how to really deal with that because uh, we have learned a lot from this. And um, if we stop the care now for those people who are left, we, we haven't completed the work. There's a lot that needs to be done. So where are where are who is responsible and who are available to assist because there's a lot that needs to be uh, really attended to regarding that family. Thank you, Togotela. Um, I believe um, uh, depending on the needs or what the patient needs, but uh, for the hospice organization, I believe can be instrumental uh, to that in terms of if there will be a need for family meetings or engagement, or else if a, a, a client will, or a family will need some counseling. We also have an office here in Matapa. Those who can come, they can come here with our social worker who is here 24 seven, except on weekends. She can be available for those ones. And then if there's a need for even for for home-based care, the organization can be available to support those families because we don't want to have more patients then uh, suffering from these consequences of uh, life-threatening and limiting costs. So once you have started, I think then is the issue of linkages uh, with the engagement or uh, the permission of the client is flexible. You can engage the uh, certain hospice uh, organization. Can be instrumental for such institutions, you know, because they are the home base, we are the hospital one. Once we are together, then we have a uh, full flesh uh, program in the country. So I think we can support one another on that issue. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mashang, for that contribution. I believe that what Dela has, uh, has been answered. Uh, Maria yes, Tamini wants to okay. add something. Thank you so much, Chair. Uh, in, in addition to what Mr. Mashamu has said, it is very difficult to, 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 to say when to we end the palliative care because there is a, a, a process which we may refer to bereavement counseling, where it will depend upon the time the, 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 the family members, especially the, the people who are left behind when our patient is dead. It, it takes, for, for some people, it will take two years to be going under 
grieving and, and all those stuff. But we are not supposed to leave them behind by the fact that the, our patient is dead. We need to take care of them and make sure that they are able to go on with their lives uh, with regards to bereavement and all, all, all those things. There are some things that we as a palliative care team are supposed to be able to help them. And we're not supposed to, to bring solutions to them, we only just guide them on to how to, to go on with life, especially when, if the parent, the dead person is a brand new All All I'm saying, Dr. is that we don't stop when the patient is dead. We continue with bereavement counseling up to maybe that time when you are satisfied that the family members are able to go on with their lives. Uh, thank you, Nkosi. I believe that was very um, insightful. And like Mr. Mashang mentioned, a swap in the hospice at home is willing um, to work together with Manzini Government Hospital or any other institution where maybe the client has passed on or maybe when the client has been discharged um, so that they can get uh, support from home-based care, palliative care. There is so much to cover in today's session and we are learning so much. But because of time, we have come to the end of our session. Thank you for joining us, um, Dr. Smithani, and thank you for the presentation, Tandazile. Thank you for the contribution and questions, colleagues. We believe that we all learned something today, and we are going to be able to apply it in our practice. Um, in our chat box, there is a link. Um, it's a feedback link that we usually click at the end of the session so that we can give feedback on how the session went. So can we kindly click that link before um, the end of the session? So our next session will be on the 22nd of February, where we will be looking at converting from short acting to long acting opioids. So we encourage you colleagues to join us once again on the 22nd of February and also invite other colleagues from other facilities and from our own facilities as well to join us um, as we have these discussions because they really influence or yes, they definitely influence the way that we work or handle cases. So thank you for, for joining us um, colleagues, but thank please remember and thank you for registering. <laughs> Please remember to click um, the feedback link and have a, a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Yes. Thank you. You can click the link before you exit.